lecture, we talk about some of the specific approaches that are available to firms <clears throat> as they decide whether and how to enter into foreign markets, how companies tend to do this. The main thing that people want to deal with or have to deal with is to decide whether or not they need to or desire to customize their offering, whatever they're selling or making, for a particular market because the market is unique enough or has its own preferences or versus trying to sell something that is standard off the shelf and sell that same product into the company into this new country that you sell into other countries. For example, commodities and things are examples of things you sell that are the same product worldwide. Corn is corn, whether you sell it in the US, Europe, Asia, or wherever. But something like a, an automobile might be customized for the particular market. That's the main kind of thought process that one has to consider. A future reference, a future lecture, we'll talk more about that. But keep that in mind, in the, in the back of your mind, as you think about the possibilities of of how one goes about entering a market. Um, one is uh, the, the most, the simplest or first step might be to continue to manufacture and make your product in your home market and then export it. So you make it or do normally what you do in selling in your local home market, but then you take some of that, ship it offshore, and try to sell it into the new marketplace in various ways. That's export, import, export kind of a process. Um, the other, another way, to, another step further, you might want to license a franchise in that country. So you're selling the product, you still make it in whatever, and you allow some other, co some other company within that country to operate in your behalf with your brand or whatever to uh, produce and sell the product in that country. Um, that's the sort of, um, you might license a, country, a company to do that, which means that uh, you, they use your brand and your, your techniques, but they do everything themselves. Or you might maintain more control and have an actual franchise uh, that you have them be part of your, your overall global com company, um, but at the same time they operate kind of locally in their own, um, their own, organ their own firm. Um, further along the full globalization spectrum, you might decide to open a subsidiary in that country. That is, start your own business that produces or or distributes the product or service in that country. Um, and the last possibility might be that you actually enter into different kinds of strategic alliances, which we'll talk about a little bit more, more later in this lecture. But there's a whole spectrum. You get your feet wet by exporting, perhaps. Then you might want a license. Then you might want a franchise. Then you might want to build a subsidiary. And all along the line, you might be partnering with other people um, in, in a joint venture, a strategic alliance of some kind to learn about and get to understand and know your business going forward. Whenever you start to build your own business in country, it's often called a greenfield, which means it's a brand new and you, you know, have to dig the foundation and build it up. Um, and that means you're starting your own company or building your own company. And there's a couple ways to do it. You might start a subsidiary business there. Or you might buy a company that's already there. And there's puts and takes for that. And there's some discussion about that in the textbook. I won't go into it in detail. But by and large, you make a decision whether or not you want to have a wholly owned, owned and operated business in that location. And you make decisions about building your greenfield operation. Typically, when you decide you want to build it internally, um, you make that decision based upon a number of strategic factors. One is cost. Is it cheaper to do that? Sometimes it's cheaper to start up rather than buy a company, that sort of thing. Um, sometimes you feel that you need to have a control over the output and it won't necessarily impact the dot demand market in that marketplace if you put your own business in place. Um, sometimes you have the ability when you start your own organization, have your own organization in country um, to improve or at least stabilize your distribution costs. You have more control over, um, over what you need to do in that, in that marketplace. You feel you have enough knowledge about how the market works to make that investment and do it right. And you also, when you build it, you might want to make sure that it has the, the, the size and the cost structure and whatever to operate effectively and profitably in that market. Because once you've opened up a business in that country, you're effectively running a business that has to be standalone profitably, profitable 
uh, in that country at least at some point. We'll talk about strategies for entering the market and moving money around and the like in a later lecture. But here, eventually, you don't want to make that investment in country unless you think that it will ultimately pay off and pay off in a big way. So those are the ways that one thinks about, uh, about building a subsidiary in country, direct investment, as they say. In terms of alliances and joint ventures, essentially the advantage of partnering with somebody who is in country is they understand their market, they know their market, you can learn from each other. Joint ventures and alliances always have the, the benefit, if you can make them work, you always have the benefit of people that understand a particular part of the world, the market, the business, the product that you don't understand, and you have a part that they don't understand, and you can bring those ideas together and learn from each other. You also might get more economies of scale because you have two players operating in the same marketplace. Um, you might be able to get complementary skills. They might have existing distribution facilities and assets, so you might be able to leverage assets and expenses on a broader on a broader base, and therefore reduce your overall uh, average costs. Um, you might be able to mitigate them, uh, your potential partner, from being a competitor of yours in certain markets. You kind of, when you have a joint venture or strategic alliance, you sort of divide up the pie. And so there's a possibility of allowing yourself to get situated in a marketplace while you're working with someone else over a period of time. And you also build relationships with people that you're in that marketplace, you're there, even though you're not a full subsidiary or greenfield, you're in that marketplace with the partner. You get to know it, understand it. Um, you begin to bring on people from that local market to work within your, your joint venture. So you start to build the skills, the human capital and the social capital within those markets so that you can succeed further down your strategy. Typically, alliances and joint ventures don't last forever. They last for a period of time, and hopefully the partners have both get something out of it and then they part amicably, which is often the case. Sometimes they don't part so amicably, but usually or oftentimes when it's well done and you have a good uh, uh, strategic alliance uh, uh, capability within your organization, that can be done uh, quite effectively. So those are some of the ways that we jump into other marketplace. The important thing to think about is that collaborative strategies are probably more important in the international marketplace than in many others, particularly as it relates to distribution, distribution partnerships and the like, because the conditions in different markets are so different. It's really easy to enter a marketplace ignorant of some of the important dynamics of competition in that marketplace. When you're there with a local partner, you can mitigate some of that risk to some degree. So collaborative strategies, joint ventures are a good way to start to learn about markets, to learn about how success uh, is achieved within those market conditions so that in the future if you want to make a greater uh, investment with a subsidiary, Greenfield, some sort of direct investment, um, you are actually able to do that as you uh, move forward. Those are some of the advantages. In, uh, in this next lecture, we'll talk about this idea of going at it in terms of a unique product in the market or a global standard product and what some of the possible strategies for that are. There's three strategic approaches in that arena um, in terms of how you address the market with products and services. And we'll talk about that in the next lecture.